I'm Brittany Hanrahan with Upward Media Partners, and today we are here with Diane Fugino, who wrote the book Heartbeat of Struggle, The Revolutionary Life of Yuri Kochiyama. Diane, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Brittany. It's a joy to be here. Diane, please tell us, give us some of your background and why you chose to write about the great Yuri Kochiyama. Yeah. I'm a professor of Asian American Studies at UC Santa Barbara, and I do research on Asian American activism, Black power activism, and Afro-Asian solidarities. And part of why I do this is because I started to do this book on Yuri Kochiyama. It's my first book. And I initially heard her speak and she blew me away as she did so many people. She was speaking, this was a long time ago, 1995, and she was speaking on Black Asian solidarities throughout history. And at the time, I thought I was doing research on Asian American women's activism. But when I asked Yuri if I could interview her, and she so graciously allowed me to, as she did for so many people, once I sat down, I, I, I'm from in California. She was living in New York, and I went out to visit her for um, several days. And once I started talking to her and got more of her story, it was very clear that there's just such a rich and multifaceted history that I wanted to center my work on her life alone. And what was it like being able to interact with her? Um, she is, um, you know, she's this big legend and at the same time, she is such a humble and down to earth person. And um, the, I remember we would invite her to UC Santa Barbara to speak a few times and everyone wanted to hear her stories, right? Of all this amazing activism that she's done and her um, really incredible life story that parallels so many moments in US history. And she just wanted to know about everyone. She wanted to know people's names, their interests. And oftentimes she walked away knowing more about people than I did, even though I had known them for longer. And then even more incredibly, she just was such a people person and had an incredible memory. She really remembered remember their names. She remembered details about them. And she would ask about people afterwards. And that's one of the takeaways I take from Yuri is that even as we're working for uh, transformative change. And in Yuri's case, I, I think it's not an, a stretch. She was working for radical change, for revolutionary change. And she never lost sight of the people involved in that and their humanity. And what was her earlier life like? Where was she born? And during her time growing up, was there any connection to um, civil rights movements or any liberation movements? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she grew up in, she was born in 1921, May 19th, same birthday as Malcolm, four years earlier, um, in San Pedro, California, Southern California, a port town. And she grew up, her father was a fish merchant. He also had a fair amount of social status. He was the president of the Japanese Association. He knew naval captains and Japanese diplomats who came through on their ships and he provided fish and other provisions. When they stopped in the port of San Pedro, he entertained them in his home. They went golfing together. So he was a man of quite a bit of social stature, a community service, and also they were solidly middle class, which at that time was quite unusual for Japanese Americans, the vast majority of whom were working class. Um, but yet at the same time, Yuri and her family faced racism, even as she was unusually for the Nisei, the second generation Japanese American, she was unusually integrated into um, mainstream white society. She was uh, student body officers at her high school. She was in sports, but still the family could live. There was racial, racial residential segregation. They could live bumped up right next to the white section of town, but that formed the barrier. They could not cross that. Um, so their social and economic status afforded them certain kinds of protections, but obviously never enough as we see during World War II. And given with this 
unusual socioeconomic status that was rare for people in her community. How did her and her family react to the racism that they experienced? For Yuri, the first really conscious and really explicit hard instances of this came um, after the bombing, Japan's bombing of Pearl Harbor, right? Late 1941, December 7th. And before they were mass removed in April of 1942. And during that period, she had been in numerous um, social service clubs and um, she was in a church, a church, a Sunday school teacher. And some of these organizations kicked her out and kicked out the other Nisei from their group. And it was shocking to Yuri and people saw her suddenly as suspicious. Um, and it was shocking to her because uh, she had never right seen herself as somebody who was dangerous. She was teaching Sunday school and supporting teen girls and doing this kind of thing. She was not uh, politically conscious at this time. And what exactly does it mean to be a model minority in society? Yeah, um, that is a term that's so closely associated with Asian Americans, right? Um, to to state that despite disadvantages, even as gre gre as egregious as the concentration camps, people can overcome their the these kinds of they would call it discrimination and uh, gain upward mobility in society. It really came became popularized in the post-war period uh, at a th there's a long history to this. And if you'd like to hear more, I'm happy to say, but people think about it in terms of the US racial context, right? So it was used to discipline the civil rights activists and especially black militancy. Um, it was used to indicate that activism and dissent and protest wasn't needed because you just work hard, put your, your head to the grindstone and, and don't make waves. And that was supposed to be the way to um, gain upward mobility. It was also linked very much globally at the time that the U.S. came to global power in the aftermath of World War II and were vying for control of Asia and the Pacific region. Um, they wanted to show and separate themselves from old world U.S. colonialism and show themselves to be the paragon in the world of democracy and freedom. And so they were invested in showing a reduction in U.S. racism. And so in the post-war period, Japanese and Chinese start to get more structural advantages than they had before suburbs open up. Um, they could get jobs equivalent to college educations, things like this. Um, but nonetheless, the, this concept of the model minority has been critiqued harshly for covering up problems within Asian America. And as I said, for erasing the need for protest. So this status of being a model minority was really more designed to keep Asian Americans complicit and not necessarily challenge any hardships that they were going through. Yes, exactly. Well said. And I think it's also important to understand that this isn't the the kind of forever racialization of Asian Americans. In fact, when Yuri was growing up in the 1920s and 30s, the yellow peril trope was much more prevalent with Japan as a rising military and imperial power seen as a direct threat to U.S. expansionism into the Pacific. And um, so, so there was a lot of sense of, of Japanese as being dangerous. In fact, could, could be said by some as the most dangerous group in the United States. What was that result for her in World War II and uh, what happened to her father? Yeah. So immediately after the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, the US FBI and the government picked up two to 3,000 Japanese American, mostly immigrant men, and they had, they were allegedly dangers to national security. Yet the government itself had done investigations through the Navy intelligence and through the department uh, uh, of um, the State Department. They did investigations into the West Coast and found that there was no evidence of espionage, sabotage, or fifth column activity. 
and they did these investigations in the fall of 1941 because of the growing tensions and conflicts between the U.S. and Japan. You know, these conflicts didn't just start on Pearl Harbor, right, December 7th. And um, so they knew that there were no threats. If there were any, they could be dealt with on an individual basis, and yet they incarcerated, de detained these two to 3,000 Japanese Americans. They were, in fact, leaders of the community, like Yuri's father, and for Yuri's family, it resulted in tragedy beyond the, the detention and incarceration. Her father on December 7th was recovering from ulcer surgery. And when the FBI came to the door and removed him, he deteriorated quickly inside the detention center on Terminal Island. And they released him, they, they held him for about six weeks and they released him only because his health was so um, deteriorated that he died the next day. Uh, do you think that his time on the island was the reason he deteriorated so quickly? It would certainly appear so, and the family absolutely thinks so, because something like ulcer surgery, had he had proper medical care, seems like it is eminently recoverable from, right? And the fact that he didn't, and in fact deteriorated, they think it's the lack of health care that he got inside the prison. And what happened to Yuri and her family? Were they eventually sent off to the internment camps? Right. Just like the entirety of the West Coast Japanese American population, 110,000 Japanese Americans um, in February of 1942, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which set in motion the procedures for dislocating um, unconstitutionally the entire West Coast Japanese American population. So in April of 1942, her family, like others, went first to these temporary assembly centers. In Yuri's family's case, it was the Santa Anita horse stables, where they literally re took out the horses and then put in Japanese American people and families. And then a few months later, her family was removed to Jerome, Arkansas more permanent concentration camp. Oh, wow. That is, I can imagine, really difficult to go through. And how does this, for Yuri, shape her view on racism? Because initially, she never really considered herself to be involved with racism. Now people are looking at Asian Americans in a negative way. And now she is in an internment camp. She was pulled from her home. How did that shift her political beliefs? I think for Yuri, what the incarceration did was really awaken her racial identity. So she came to see herself as a Japanese American. And Yuri always reminds us, this is before ethnic studies, this is before the Black and Asian and Chicano and Indigenous movements of the 60s, right, which really raised people's polit uh, racial consciousness. So she really came to see herself as a Japanese American. She speaks of being really proud of Japanese Americans um, for the ways that they endured this period. Um, but it's surprising. I think from this side of that history, we would think that something like the concentration camps would awaken a political consciousness. But it was very mixed for Yuri, as it is for so many. And I got to read her diary that she kept. She was always a writer and she, she journaled and she kept a diary inside the Santa Anita so-called assembly center. And in it, she talks about problems that are happening to the Japanese Americans, the Nisei soldiers that are being sent away. And she writes something so incredible like, you know, if I had been subject to prejudice, I would have been really upset. So she didn't see herself as subject to discrimination and prejudice, despite writing from inside a concentration camp. But these are the unevenness of, of conscientization. And I do think it lays the groundwork for her understanding about race and racism as the civil rights movement, and especially the black power movement unfolds in the fifties and sixties. How did her exit from the internment camps shift her views as an Asian American uh, activist in regard to her family meetings and writings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, she, she 
was always somebody who engaged in tremendous community service. Um, and she, from her youth, some people even say her childhood, she was doing things to support people who were experiencing hardships, but especially in her youth in high school, she was always trying to lift people up. She started to counsel um, junior high girls and had them over for sleepovers and the Sunday school teacher and really a whirlwind of community service. But um, she would say absolutely not an activist in terms of a political activist at this time who understood uh, structures of power, who had an analysis of why social problems existed and who worked with others collectively to try to create transformations, right? Um, so after doing all of this kind of community service as a young person, after the war in 19, well, even during the war, she was supporting the Nisei soldiers who were um, sent to Europe or, or the Pacific uh, war front. And she started a group called the Crusaders inside the Santa Anita camp, which were her junior high school, um, Sunday school class. And she had them writing to the Nisei soldiers uh, who were experiencing the discrimination, right? from within the U.S. Army on the war front, right? And also so far from home. And these are young people, right? 19, 20, 18 year olds who, who were fighting and um, while their families were inside concentration camps. So she always wanted to provide that kind of support and um, had them writing. And then also during the war, she worked at the USO, the United Service Organization, to support the Nisei soldiers inside the Jerome concentration camp and then left the camp um, as people were able to do after 1943 or during 1943 and um, went to Mississippi to do this work. This is inside the Jerome USO. She meets her future husband, Bill Kochiyama, who's a Nisei soldier for the United States Army. And after he returns from overseas service, she moves to New York in January of 1943. So the war has now just ended, right, in August of 45. And um, she and Bill marry and they start a family. And But they continue this active life of community service where they're now supporting mostly Chinese and Japanese Americans who are in route now to the Korean War in the early 50s. Um, they're also doing things like supporting the Hiroshima Maidens, or what the newspapers call the Hiroshima Maidens, who were 25 atomic bomb survivors uh, of the, you know, of Hiroshima, U.S. atomic uh, bombing of Hiroshima, who come to the United States in the mid-50s for surgeries. And the Quakers set this up and they support them um, in New York City. And then the, the Japanese American, the Nisei soldiers, or the now veterans, and so Bill Kochiyama, his group, Yuri Kochiyama, they do tremendous work to support these women as they're living in right, a foreign country and undergoing this very difficult reconstructive surgery. The 25 women had a, about 138 surgeries all together. So she's doing a lot of community service is my point. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. And it seems like in the beginning, she didn't initially identify as an activist, but it did seem to always be a part of who she was to do community service work and to be mm -hmm. a helping yes, hand. Yes, absolutely. I would agree with that. 